On the 1st of July in 1969, three important events occurred in Wales. One, the death of the Abergelly martyrs, freedom fighters of Mediod and Dithing Cymru, who were planting a bomb at a government office in Abergelly to hinder the advance of Prince Charles towards Carnarvon. Two, the investiture of Charles as English Prince for Wales in Carnarvon. Three, my sentencing and eventual imprisonment for nine months in Cardiff jail for opposing the investiture. And after a long trial of nine of us, who were mem most of us members of the anti-investiture campaign committee, it was called the FWA trial, but in fact, it was a trial of the Patriotic Front and members of that campaign committee to resist the investiture of Charles as the English Prince for Wales. Following will be an interview which tells the story of my struggle during the 60s for Welsh freedom and in opposition to the investiture. Gethin, we will start at the beginning. You were born in Murphy Titville to Terence and Doreen Griffiths. You were the first of two boys. Would you like to tell us a bit about your early years and what and who were the influences on you at this early stage in your life? My uh, early years are spent in a district of Merthyr called Caedraw, living in a little link called uh, Ponside. My father had been away in the war around British Isles, mending aeroplanes and maintenance on aeroplanes. So for the first five years of my life, I grew up with my mother, my grandfather and grandmother in Ponside. I can remember my grandfather taking me for walks around Merthyr and pointing out various locations and their history. And one incident <laughs> with my grandfather was he came and picked me up from bed, wrapped me in a blanket and took me out and showed me a big store going on fire. I guess the influences on my early years, because you're very young, is that uh, you learn a lot later from my mother, but my grandfather died in a colliery accident. He'd been wounded twice in the First World War and then goes and dies in a colliery accident. His wife died a year or two later and we moved, my father by then had come home and we had moved to Pencoy near Bridgend. Those were my early years. I remember my father telling me that my grandfather, who was an hard man, was one of Merthyr's last mountain fighters. There's bare metal fighting on the mountains and often being chased by police. This would have an influence on my father and his brother because they both become boxers and my uncle was in particular a professional boxer. My grandfather was born and had his first job in the pits of Abakanai. My grandmother was born and brought up in Hilagerig, which, by the way, was not just a one township, ordinary township, but a Tien and Ors township. The centre of revolution in Merthyr in 1831 was China and Caedrao, and it was from Caedrao that much of the resistance came to the police and the soldiers occupying Merthyr. Your family then moved to Pencoid, where you had your nursery, primary and secondary education. What can you tell us of those days? And did anything in those school days influence your later political philosophy in life? Interestingly, my first kind of influence of Welshness upon me was when out of my mother lined the drawers with newspapers, as they did in those days. The newspaper used was the Western Mail, and it was there I used to read the old Western Mails and the new Western Mails and get, got my idea of Wales as an identity. But it was later on in secondary modern school that I became influenced towards nationalism, largely by my friendship with a local lad who spoke Welsh, from a Welsh-speaking farmer's family. And he used to tell me his parents used to listen to illegal Plaid Cymru radio broadcasts. And this influenced both of us. 
and I used to write old Rule for Wales on the back of my school books, for which, in one instant, I got caned. Six canes for just writing old Rule for Wales on the back of an exercise book. Later on, when Morgan Mountie and I left school, we went back one night and we painted old Rule for Wales in big letters on the school walls. How much comic history were you taught whilst at school? Very little. And in fact, there was no special history class. History was given to us by the Welsh language teacher. It was a nice little girl from Bangor University. But many of the children, including myself, sadly to say, were quite naughty in the classroom with her and weren't particularly interested in learning Welsh. So one day I had been particularly bad. She told me to stay behind and tidy up. As I was tidying up things away into the cupboard, a book fell out. And the book was Raise Up the Drawbridge. And it was full of the stories of Welsh princes and heroes fighting the English to liberate their country. Now this was an eye-opener for me, because if we were taught any history at all by the Welsh language teacher, it is the religious history of the Bible, by Steadfords, and not least the religious preachers of this 18th and 19th century, but certainly not proper, what I call now proper Welsh history. You left school when you were 15, so when after that did you become a political activist in the real sense? When I left school and started work in the sewing machine industries of South Wales, I, like lots of teenagers, were just interested in local dance halls, which were very violent in South Wales in those days, with gangs fighting each other, but not using knives, just their fists. And also, of course, going out with girls. But in the background, this is the background period which is filtering into my brain. It is the period of the Mau Mau War in Kenya, the Yoga struggle in Cyprus, troubles in Aden, troubles in Egypt, and of course, troubles in America. And this all filtered across my brain, as did influence from the struggle of the Quebec people and the struggle of Flemish people in Flanders. This drifted across my mind, but I was too busy working, and then eventually my family moved to Somerset. This was about 1963, and by then I had subscribed to the Ply Cymru paper, The Nation, and the big news was Trewerin. And it was the bomb attack on Trewerin by Owen Williams that motivated me to return to Wales and help with the struggle. This I did on the Oust Ferry, as the Seven Bridge was being built above it. And once back in Wales, I went to Cardiff and actually slept in the stadium by lifting the gate up and going to sleep on the benches there. But it was too cold, so I went down to the cricket pavilion and was sleeping there. In the morning, a groundsman seen me and said, what are you doing? And I said, I've just come from Somerset and uh, I was tired. And he said, oh, well, come in. And he allowed me to shower in the rugby player's shower room. After that, I went round to the Ply Cymru office and there I met Lewis, the Republican. Pleda, took me to a map on the wall and showed me where the pipelines were. After that, it was throw six and eventually go to jail. But that was my influences. Republican nationalism. From there, in time, I hitchhiked to North Wales and found Owen Williams and had a good discussion with him. That was the turning point in my life. I gradually became a full-blown nationalist. Later, when I went to work on a farm in Abergwine, Raleigh, meet a Welsh-speaking family on that farm, and went into town on my day off, and went to see DJ Williams and have a chat with him. Later on, Ply Cymru had a conference in Fishguard, and it was there I met Tony Lewis, and one night we went out to pull Union Jacks down and got caught by the police. But Peter Lewis came round and got them to release us. From there on, Tony and I became firm friends and comrades, and out of this friendship came the Patriotic Front. I had joined Ply Cymru 
and after a while became active with them in Bridgen. But uh, I was sent to Brecon and Radna to help Trevor Morgan, who was fighting that constituency for Plaid Cymru. Trevor Morgan founded the first Welsh language school in Bridgen, a Scoglin Dool. Trevor and his family and his wife are great people. In fact, it was his wife who suggested I adopt the name Gethin rather than Keith. I had already, following the influence of the Black Panthers, dropped my slave name of Griffith and adopted the Welsh name of Ab Griffith. From there, I went on to be more active with Plaid Cymru and went to their summer school in Machanclyth and there was successfully meeting other nationalists who would eventually be brought over to the Patriotic Front, which Tony Lewis and I had founded in Cumbran. What type of background did recruits to the Patriotic Front and FWA come from? Mostly, if not all, working class youngsters. And because of Kaya's publicity, um, many were coming from all over Wales, and there was a large contingent from the Ronda led by Robert Upstephan, who in those times was wearing an FWA uniform. But uh, lots, and mainly working class, like the leaders of the anti investiture campaign committee in the FWA and the Patriot Front. The nine defendants in the trial in Swansea were largely class people. Kyle might have seemed a bit above this, but he was an horse breeder, he worked for a living. Tony was a bus driver, Duke he was a labourer, I was a labourer, and there were others who were, Glyn was a forestry worker, so they were working class people. So really, our ideal home would have been the Communist Party, but uh, no, we formed our own nationalist organisation which was possibly right of centre. We were taking Welsh politics, nationalist politics, out of the ivory towers of universities and onto the streets. We were led in this direction by being very aware of such movements as the Black Panthers in America. These are the type of people we idolise, not the pacifist struggles that Kondrathus Yedraith admired. The intended investiture of Charles Windsor had initially been announced by the Queen in Caerdydd in 1958 at the Commonwealth Games, and by 1967 it was well known that the intention was to become a reality and an anti-investiture campaign was set up. How active was the Patriotic Front on this issue? A key moment for the Patriot Front was then we organised the first Kilmeri Rally and there attended a very successful event bringing young people and older people from all over the country to the militant cause and it was about this time that they decided to have an investiture in Carnarvon for Prince Charles to make him Tawasa Cymru and this riled us and we seen as the most important struggle we could be involved in and we took to the streets and campaigned. And it was the Patriotic Front who founded the Anti-Investiture Campaign Committee and Candrathus Llewellyn and held meetings throughout Wales and protests. And I was arrested in Cardiff for throwing a smoke bomb outside the Welsh office and arrested outside the Temple of Peace for throwing out. We were a militant movement and many of us were arrested. And that was where our real struggle began. Of course, Chief of our comrades was Kyle Evans, Dennis Cossack and others of the Thebels Army. They played a valuable contribution to the cause. Kyle was very much a publicist and carried out great propaganda. Patrick Front was organising against the investiture, protests and demonstrations. Meanwhile, media and different country, led by John Jenkins, was carrying out a more militant campaign of bombs throughout Wales and this I see as the total resistance and indeed I had borrowed a book from Bridgend Library well actually I liberated it and kept it it was called Total Resistance it was the handbook of the Swiss Army 
And so when I was arrested, the police found this book and thought, oh my God, this is dangerous. And they took it off me and I never got it back. What was your relationship with Plaid Cymru like in the 60s? Pretty good in the early years because in those days many of the members of Plaid Cymru were ex-Republicans and they were militant and they were radical and they were great people. Unlike Plaid Cymru today, which is made up of a lot of fellow travellers from all sorts of directions. But in those days there were people like Cliff Berry, Emrys Roberts, Peter Lewis, Ari Webb, and these were, there were many, many more, and so we could get on with Plaid Cymru. And we had stores at Plaid Cymru conferences. But later on, as we become more associated with the FWA, and sympathetic to Mac, and more militant in our demonstrations, as throwing smoke bombs, Plaid Cymru started to edge us out. Certain quarters have played down the influence and the role played by the FWA in the 1960s, referring to them as theatrical um, jokers. What have you got to say about that? was a man that could be seen as a modern day Tung Shun Kaki, and how much people loved him and supported him could be seen on the size of his film role. Kaio was a great man and a wonderful publicist. Our struggle would not have got anywhere without Kayo, so I'll stand by Kayo and reject the traitors who make these disparaging remarks about our national hero. In a newspaper interview in 1968, Gavin, you predicted that the investiture of Charles Windsor would only go ahead in Carnarvon if the uh, Carnarvon was surrounded by a ring of steel. What did you actually mean by that? Uh, the English would have to pour into the area thousands of soldiers and police and special squad members. This we achieved thanks to the Three Wells Army's propaganda, Max bombing campaign and the activities of the Patriot Front. Keeping in mind that we had a rally in 1968 which blocked the gates of Carnarvon Castle and this all scared the British. Not, not many people were able to get into Canal with the protest. They also put lots of people under house arrest and they arrested people. But that was the, our victory. The English state did have to pour into Canal thousands of soldiers and police. By 1969, it was quite obvious that the British state and the authorities were very concerned about your activities and you, along with eight other people, were arrested um, on the 28th of February 1969. Can you tell us what occurred and, and how did this influence the anti-investiture campaign? Well, the police came on a dawn raid to uh, where I was living in Anglesey, and they brought with them police women to look after the baby. You picked the baby, my daughter, out of the cot and looked through the cot and the blankets to see if there was any arms or bombs or God knows what. After that, I was taken to Swansea Prison and there with my eight comrades, we stayed for many months while we were tried in the Crown Court in Swansea. This disrupted our campaign greatly. It left it in the hands of the pacifist conditus de life, who believed in pacifist, passive resistance. That will be shown later when they didn't have the guts to go to Carnarvon to protest, but I was Valier Kilmeri and unbelievably said, paint out English signs about investiture, but leave the Welsh ones up. If you hadn't been arrested on February the 28th, 1969, and kept imprisoned um, right up to the day of the investiture, what plans did the Patriotic Front have to disrupt the investiture in Carnarvon? Plans to disrupt the investiture were based on all individuals getting into Carnarvon and putting smoke bombs in the drains and carrying out demonstrations. We had linked up with some Kandaisas right people who had committed themselves to blockading the roads, which they never did. However, the important thing to remember is this. Nine gallant patriots did go to Carnarvon and were arrested. And also a pavilion was burnt down in Pocheli 
and patriots and bring of the Seigneur tore up the investiture commemorative gardens. As for ourselves, we, were, we knew that the police would mount an attack on us and we'd already, with tips from the book Total Resistance, decided to bury drums in the woods and mountains of Wales with food supplies so we could disappear into the mountains a month before the investiture. Also, in case we had to make a quick exit from Wales, members had gone to Scotland and made, made arrangements with Scottish nationalists to put us up in safe houses until we could get out of the country. This was our commitment. We would go to the bitter end to stop this treachery in Carnarvon. You were sentenced at three o'clock on the 1st of July at exactly the same time that Charles Windsor was invested as Prince of Wales in Carnarvon. What happened then? I was rushed out of the back door of the court in Swansea, put in a very fast car and whisked off to Cardiff prison and put in a cell. The next morning the warders came to me and said, you have some visitors. So I was taken to an interview room and there sitting at the eye table was Jock Wilson and his special squad. And they said to me, we haven't finished with you. So I just looked at them, tipped over a chair I was supposed to sit in and said, well, I've finished with you. Let me go back to this special squad at Jock Wilson. Obviously, the English didn't think the Welsh special branch was up to it. They were too friendly for the starters with lots of the nationalists and family members. It was very difficult for them. So they brought in the special squad from England. This reminds me of involving the special squad. I was arrested and taken to Bregen police headquarters and there taken into a room which was theatrically set out in dark, no lights on apart from one lamp bent down over the table so I couldn't see who was asking me questions. And as the questions went on I just wouldn't answer so they said well you're going to give us some answer if you don't we're going to electrocute you. And they pointed to a lead coming down from the ceiling to just in front of me. I, I just laughed, they said, go ahead, I don't mind an electric shock or two. So they just released me, and that was that. But the special squad, they were dangerous, dangerous people. That Many of them had been trained abroad in Eng England's struggles. But it's very interesting, years later, when I went to the christening of a grandson in Bridgen, a man came up to me and said, hey, believe it or not, I was one of the policemen in that interview. He was a Welsh cop, huh? And he said, believe me, I was so embarrassed at what the special squad was doing, but of course I couldn't say anything. So that's the sort of background we were fighting against, you know, and uh, shows how determined the English was to make sure there was no resistance to the investiture. Gethin, do you think there will be another investiture in Cadavan? And do you think that any protests will be held against it? Well, we shall see. But let me say this much. I spent the last six months trying to organise protests in Carnarvon for the 50th, 50th investiture commemoration. The object of this would be to send a message out that there will be protests. Nobody turned up and it was left to Sean and I to go around Carnarvon with posters. There will be an investiture, and shall I tell you why there will be an investiture? Go into Car Carnarvon Castle and see the exhibition for 1969 for the crowning of Prince Charles. There's eight panels on the wall. Six of them are about the English Princes of Wales. Just two about the Welsh Princes of Wales. Also in that room is the throne, the investiture throne, ready to put on the dyers in the, in the grounds of the castle to have the third investiture of William. The crown, the cape and the sword are in the cellar of James, St. James's Palace, well guarded. Are they going to have another investiture? You bet, because the link of, of the English old on Wales is this title, the Prince of Wales, held by 19, or is it 26, English Princes of Wales. And they have so brainwashed the Welsh people. And the Welsh people, especially the nationalists, have done nothing to counter this. For instance, why haven't the people of Gwynedd and Carnarvon in particular built an exhibition in that town telling the true story of what the English did in 1282 and 1283? 
butchering Sloelli and cutting his head off, stealing the crown jewels, taking David prisoner with his children, putting his children in Bristol prison until they're old men and die there, and executing David in the most savage way, and drawn and quartering. Very interesting. The last Welshman to be undrawn and quartered while the Commodorian was setting themselves up in London to be grovelers of the English crown was David Morgan from South Wales, who fought the Jacobites against the English, and he was undrawn and quartered. Not many people know this, and it is about time people were taught their history. But the important thing is, yes, there will be a third investiture. They've got everything counting on it, and they won't back off, because if they do back off, it will be a serious admission, admission that the Welsh have won in 1969. Now, the David Ewan last week went and met the um, Bills, Charles Windsor, at his holiday home in Mervai by Camarthenshire and shook his hands, something he had refused to do for over 50 years. What's your opinion of this, Gavin? Not well, very much. I think it's an act of total treachery. And in fact, I would regard David Ewan as much a quizzling now as George Thomas who uh, was responsible very much for the 1969 investiture. And why? Well, was there any need for him really to meet with Prince Charles and have a secret meeting of which we know absolutely nothing went on, other than the fact that in this film, The Prince of E, and in at least two books and other programmes, David E. has made a big deal about regretting the campaign against the investiture in 1969 and why he is opposed to a further campaign against William being invested as a Prince of Wales. This is just so unbelievable. But what is really unbelievable is that the eldest meeting with Charles on the 1st of July, 50 years after 1969, 50 years after the death of the Abergelly martyrs, he walked on their grave with little sign of shame or anything. Also, by having critical view of the 1969 investiture campaign, he slapped in the face all the members of Cymdaithesi Reith and Plai Cymru who opposed the investiture. Just who does this fat cat cracker think he is? You know, he's being presented as some holier-than-thou person. Well, David, i got news for you. With my dying breath, and I'm age 73, and I've got IBF and diabetes, no matter, I will organise now, from now on, a campaign against the third investiture. Dear Following the arrest of John Jenkins and your release from prison, you went into exile in Ireland. Why was that? This was because I was left with the impression by the police they were not going to leave me alone. During the trial, for instance, I went into the witness box, but then all of a sudden I noticed Inspector Fisher and in Tusker Watkins' notes to ask me questions. I became increasingly aware these are questions I refused when taken in for interrogation. But now, in court, I was getting field interrogation and if you refuse to answer questions in court you're in deep trouble. So I thought the best way out of this was just to plead guilty and get it over with. And that's what I did. Later on when I was released from prison, apart from that incident I've already mentioned taking place in prison, when John was arrested I was starting to think, oh they're going to come for me again. So I quit Wales and went to Ireland. Went to the Sinn Féin office, got help there from Sean McStoyton, and they passed on to a, a lovely couple, Des and Mary, who worked for the Irish Times. They were Labour Party people, but they put me up in their house. And I was also fed by a Scottish anarchist lady who had run a restaurant in Dublin, down Bagot Street. And she used to give me food and everything, and there I became involved in various social activities in Dublin campaigns against the destruction of Georgian houses and so forth. But then I got my own job 
in a restaurant in a corner street, the Green Rooster. And there I became a grill chef. I looked at the menu after I got the job. I thought, God, I'll have to learn this quick. So when I started work, there was a lovely cook in the kitchen. And uh, I said to her straight, I said, I haven't got a clue about this job. Can you help me through it? And she covered for me until I learned the ropes. And that was the way it was throughout my life in Dublin. The people were so good. The early 70s in Dublin were quite vicious and violent. Protestants were coming down from the north and laying bombs around the place. One of these bombing incidents was on St. Stephen's Day. So when I crossed the bridge at 7 o'clock in the morning towards work, I seen this huge crowd outside the restaurant. And as I got closer, I suddenly seen loads of police. And one of the angels on the Daniel O'Connor monument, monument opposite my restaurant had been blown off and lay on a side in the road. The blast had taken out all the front part of the restaurant. If women had been working in there as waitresses, they would have been killed. But luckily it was in the early hours of the morning. At night time, there was often rallies outside the GPO and lorries would pull up and young men would get on them and head north. They handed guns by the Irish army to fight against the Protestants in Derry who were persecuting the Catholics. But then, one day going home from work, I called up my local news agents, but the news agent said to me, they're looking for you. And I said, oh, and he said, the Dublin Castle Boys, in other words, the Irish Special Branch. So I shrugged my shoulders, didn't say anything, and went home. A few days later, there was a knock on the door, and it was the Irish Special Branch. And I invited him in, him in and started to have a chat with him, and he said to me, look, he said, I've had a communication from Inspector Fisher in Wales. They want you back, and they want us to send you back. And he said, but look, I'm not going to do the work of the Brits, so just stay out of Irish politics and you'll be safe. So I did. You returned from Ireland to Cymru in 1972 and started the Covian movement. Yes, whilst in Ireland, I used to attend the events of the National Commemoration Association and uh, these used to teach Irish people their history. So when I came back to Wales I founded the National Commemoration Association in Wales but Ira Gap Willen, one of our early members, suggested we call it Covering. So we did. We had as our badge the Ivy Leaf. Now this idea came from Ireland as well because I had found out that Parnell after his death, to remember him, people wore an ivy leaf, which is also, of course, a Greek symbol of remembrance. So we started Kovion, and our purpose was to radically fight cerebral communism, which was causing historical amnesia amongst our people. We see this as a great priority, and we did this through literature and by organising commemorative events as in Machinsworth, Corwin, Kilmary, Abergeli, Bryn Glass and many other places. We also organised field trips and took people away to various historic sites as Craig Mawr in Cardigan. This went on for a number of years but then as we entered the period of the Maybe England Ur Arson War we became more to the attention of the police and because some of our committee, as John Jenkins, myself, Neil Upshenkin, Tony Lewis, Lynn Rowlands, had been in trouble in the 60s with the police. They thought we might be behind the arson war. We were not. Many of us were arrested on seal blow down. Myself and Sean were taken to Carmarthen and kept in separate cells. For full information on the seal blow down raids, See the booklet, Operation Tan. One of our greatest achievements was putting a memorial up at Abati Kumir where Llewellyn's headless body was, had been buried underneath the altar stones. His head had been taken to London and put on a pike in the Tower of London. Our other great achievement was organising a 700th anniversary rally at Kilmary, uh, to which 2,500 people came and we marched from Kilmary into Bilth and around the town. This was 
and I watermark in many ways. Today, I don't so much give a lot of credit to Kilmeri as being the site where Llewellyn was killed. I believe the historian Anthony Edwards will realise that Llewellyn had been part killed due to a conspiracy of the Bishop of Bangor and the King Edward and Anglo-Normans in Mid Wales and he was captured there and his bodyguard slain and he was taken wounded to a cave Ogof Llewellyn in Aberedu. And there he lay dying overnight with his priest and in the morning the Norm Anglo Normans came, dragged him out of the cave and cut his head off. His priest, thankfully, had taken a piece of the Christ Nide off Llewellyn's body and went back to Gwynedd to deposit it in the treasure house there. Unfortunately, later on, this was betrayed to Edward and was stolen along with all the other royal treasures. And this is something we are ashamed of, that in Wales we do not campaign for the return of the Cloisnaid and the royal treasures, treasures in the way the Scots campaign for the Stone of Scone. After some years following Corwin's demise, I, with Sean Evan, started Fis Gynadaeth Lindur, and we continued much of the work begun by Corwin, but concentrating on the boy Lindur. But that's another big story, and will be told again in a book and on another film. In the meantime, I suggest you look at the blogs Owen Lindur communicates. back in the 60s, at least in Wales, but not as violent as prisons are now. And warders and fellow prisoners were quite decent with us. And uh, it was not all doom and gloom. There were a number of incidents which were brought smiles to our face. Not least, Coslet organising us into an hunger strike. And we were taken down into the bowels of the courtroom. And then Coslet was saying to us, remember, don't eat any food. So, eight of us didn't eat any food. And as the trays were put out and collected and put on a trolley, we noticed that they were all still full of food, except Coslet's. His was empty. And when we asked him, did you go on your hunger strike? He said, no, I was feeling hungry. <laughs> Another incident in the uh, Swansea courthouse when we went down to collect our dinners was Kyle was at the back and he kept coming up to us and saying, can I take your place? I've got to get near the front. And we said, well, why? And he said, no, don't ask questions. Just let me get to the front. And uh, we soon realised, well, suddenly appearing through a half-open window was a copy of the Western Mail, which was immediately grabbed, the hand on the Western Mail, by police officers outside. And <laughs> we learned later, it was Kaya's wife, with a file rolled up in the Western Mail, giving it, handing it over to Kaya, which he never got, of course. But what Kaya was going to actually do with it, I don't know. File his way out of the bars of Swansea Prison. Kaya, straight away in prison in Swansea, started his arts and craft business. He asked us all to take the red wool out of our socks, which were grey, and give it to him, because he was making a dragon on his prison t-shirt. <laughs> and uh, from there, in Cardiff prison, Kyle and I were sitting at the same table taking telephones apart. apart. Kyle would be busy with the pieces he took out of the phone, making Celtic crafts, including Celtic crosses and all sorts of things. Kyle was indeed a very happy man in prison, and it was to my relief that I was in prison with him, because I'd be sitting with him at the table, and he'd be telling me cardigans or folk tales, 
one of which I remember very well, a white horse of Brechwa. Cayo loved telling that story because it involved an horse, of course. Cayo and his Celtic craft industry on our table would often run out of little useful bits and bobs. So he'd get up and he'd wander around the workshop asking for bits and bobs off other tables. And often, eventually, one of the warders would be sitting on a night chair looking at us all, would say, Where's Evans? And he'd spot Cayo on the other side of the room and he said, Evans, get back to your table. Both Cayo and Tony were expert amateur craftspeople. Cayo made a lot in prison and uh, Tony made a lot as well. And so, here's some examples. This is a, a belt buckle made by uh, Cayo. And here's two medals he awarded me. Won the Resistance Cross, I won the White Eagle Cross. Kai used to get his eagles from Barclays Bank. <laughs> <laughs> Little did they know, they were suppliers of the female's arm. <coughs> Tony, of course, did the Peter Rick Flint symbol. Of course, both would be sorted with the White Eagle Cross. And Tony used to enamel some, like that. He was very good at enameling Tony. He could do rings as well. And, uh, and that was that. From Cardiff Prison. Um, they took me up to the back, the, behind the front door. Um, all of a sudden, a policeman grabbed me and took me down to a side door. And it opened and I stepped out and opposite was a number of the Shrewsbury Special Squad. And I thought, oh no, I'm going to get a gate arrest. And they just stood staring at me and I stood staring at them. And I thought, well, i got to move. So I started walking up the street and there was a huge crowd at the front gate who had come to greet me coming out of prison. I looked back and no, the Special Squad wasn't behind me. It was just there to spook me. Gwyneth has to decide regards the third investiture. They fight it or they get on their knees and surrender. I say fight it because you, otherwise you're going to be remembered for what? The treachery in 1969 but worse. Netflix will be showing a recreation of this investiture around the world and you have people everywhere thinking that you in Gwynedd have no guts to stand by your own history so get off your knees and fight back no surrender